Welcome back to Math TV with Professor V. This is section 2.3, 2.4, and 2.5 for introductory statistics. We're kicking things off with organizing quantitative data. Now, quantitative data is often grouped into classes. This is also referred to or known as categories or bins, okay? So if you hear any one of those terms, they all mean the same thing, classes, categories, or bins. And remember, quantitative data is numerical data. In the previous video lecture, we went over how to organize qualitative data, and now we're gonna look at how to organize numerical data. So once we group our quantitative data into classes, then we can construct frequency and relative frequency distributions of the data just like we did with all our qualitative data previously. So just some general guidelines. When you're making classes, the number should be between five and 20. If you have fewer than five, then it's often not very insightful because your data isn't differentiated enough. You can't see any trends. And then if you have more than 20, then you also can't see any trends or interpret what's going on with the distribution of the data, which we'll talk about later. Because everything's just too spread out. You can't see, you know, where a lot of the values lie or what's going on. So between five and 20, guys. Um, second guideline is that each observation should belong to only one class, no double dipping. And then third, whenever possible, all classes should have the same width. So you want them all basically evenly spaced if possible, okay? So the first method that we're gonna talk about is single value grouping. And this is a method for grouping data in which each class represents a single possible value. So basically every data value is its own class. And this is good when you have discrete data, so data that you count instead of measure, in which there's only a small number of distinct values, okay? So as long as you only have maybe between five and 20 values in your data set, then it's okay to do single value grouping. So let's look at an example here. The Television Bureau of Advertising publishes information on television ownership in trends in television. Table 2.4 gives the number of TV sets per household for 50 randomly selected households. Use single value grouping to organize these data into frequency and relative frequency distributions. And here they're giving us the number of TV sets in each of the 50 randomly selected households. So we're gonna make a frequency and relative frequency distribution. I noticed here someone reported zero. That looks like that's the min. So that's gonna be my smallest class. Can you guys see what the max is? I see a six, okay. And I don't think anyone has more than six TVs, right? That they surveyed. I mean, I know plenty of people who have more than six TVs. So number of TVs. And then um, we'll list the frequency for each and then the relative frequency. All right, so the number of TVs, since we're doing single value grouping, each observation or data set is its own class. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then now we have to figure out the frequency for each of these observations or data values. So how many times was zero televisions reported or observed? So let's see here, let's go through. Top row, nothing. Second row, no. Third row, no. There's just that one little zero TV. I wonder, do they read all day? I would need a TV. Okay. Um, how many have just one TV? Let's see. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So I got sixteen here. Okay, anyways, you keep going. Um, I already did this, don't worry. So for two TVs, the frequency is 14. For three, it's 12. For four, it's three. 
for five it's two, and for six it's two. Now they did tell me that there were, you know, the size of this sample is 50. They surveyed 50 people. I always like to total up myself and make sure I get 50 also. That way I know I didn't miss anything, you know? Okay, so, and, you know, I like to not use a calculator when I can. So 16 plus 14, that's 30. Yes, it is. And then here we've got 12 plus 3, that's 15. So 30 and 15, that's 45. And then 1, 2 there, that's another 5. So 50. Boom, we got it. Okay. So there's my frequency distribution. Now remember, to get relative frequency, you divide each of the frequencies by the total number of observations or the size of the sample, so 50. So one divided by 50, 0 0.02. 16 divided by 50 is 0 0.32, etc. So I'll just fill them all in for you. 14 divided by 50 is 0.28. 12 divided by 50 is 0.24. 3 divided by 50.06, 2 divided by 50.04, same thing. And then if you total up your relative frequencies, remember they should sum to 1. It might sum to um, 0.99 or like a little bit above 1 if you had to do some rounding, but we didn't in this case, so it should be 1 on the dot. And that's, I always like to sum them up too because it's a good check just in case you mess something up, okay? You'll catch it. How fabulous. Okay, so this is single value grouping. Let's look at another kind, all right? The next type of method for organizing our quantitative data is limit grouping. So in this case, each class consists of a range of values, okay? So more than one observation would go in a specific class, particular class. The smallest value that could go in a class is called the lower limit of the class. And then the largest value that could go in the class is called the upper limit of the class, okay? The class width is the difference between the lower limit of a class and then the lower limit of the next class above it or below. And class mark is the average of the two class limits of a class. So if you take the lower class limit, the upper class limit, and you average them, that's your class mark. There's other names for this sometimes too. So like I wouldn't sit around making flashcards for these definitions, just, just so you know. And then useful when the data are expressed as whole numbers. Okay, this is when we use limit grouping. And there's too many distinct values to use single value grouping, okay? So it wouldn't make sense to let each observation be its own class because there's just too many, like more than 20. Honestly, I even think 20 sometimes is too much. Okay, so let's look at an example here. Table 2.6 displays the number of days to maturity for 40 short-term investments. The data are from Barron's Magazine. Okay, thank you. Use limit grouping with grouping by tens to organize these data into frequency and relative frequency distributions. Okay, so they told us they um, we need to group by tens. Okay, and then let's see, always start off, identify the min and the max for your data set. So here we go, scavenger hunt time. Um, what's the min value? I think it's 36, yes? Okay, and the max, 99. Okay, so what does that mean for me? Well, the min is 36, and if I'm trying to, remember, they told me we're grouping by tens, yes? So my lowest class would be the class 30 to 39. That's the lowest. And then from there, I'm going to go all the way up to 90 to 99. Nothing bumped into 100, okay? So days to maturity, the first class is going to be 30 to 39. Then we have 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69. See how there's a range of values that fall within each class? So this is a class, this is a class, this is a class. It's no longer just one data value that falls in. 70 to 79. 
80 to 89 and 90 to 99. Okay, so now you're gonna go through and tally up how many times an observation falls within each class. So 30 to 39, I'm looking. Is anything within 30 to 39 here? No. Anything here? Yeah. This one, this one, and this one. So I have three so far. What about 40 to 49? Let's see. 40 to 49. Here's one. That's it. 50 to 59. Anyways, you get the idea, right? Do we want to sit here and do it? I'll do one more. 50 to 59. Let's get the green highlighter out. 50 to 59. Okay, this one's in there. Mm, this one. This one. 50 to 59. It's, it's relaxing, you know. People do Sudoku or color to relax. We group data. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got eight. Did you guys get the same thing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Anyways, let's get this show on the road. I'll tell you what the rest are. There were 10 in the next one. I guess we don't have to tally if you're just counting them up, but whatever. I put it there in case you wanted to give it a shot or do that when you do the homework. So frequency for each, three, one, eight, 10, seven, seven, four, okay? And then also like, look, 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 look. This is how you're gonna check you didn't miss anybody. There's five rows, okay? And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight columns. Five times eight is 40. Yep, we have 40 data points. 40 observations, sum up the frequencies, that total better be 40, otherwise you miss somebody, okay? So this is a great way to check that you miss nobody. Does it sum to 40? Check. So this is four plus eight is 12. Now we're at 22, 29, 36, 40. Yep, okay, great. And then for relative frequency, you take each of the frequencies, divide by 40, so 0 0.075, one divided by 40 is 0 0.025, etc. I'll just fill them all in. And then be careful um, when you're doing your homework, especially the online homework, just round to however many decimal places the problem directs you or your teacher tells you because it won't accept the answer if you don't round to the correct number of decimal places, okay? And there's no set number always with these, so just be on the alert. And these better sum up to one, which they do. Okay, very good. So this is called what again? This is limit grouping, all right? We've got one more method for grouping our quantitative data, and that's called cut point grouping. So lower class cut point is the smallest value that could go in a class. That's like our lower class limit for the other grouping method that we just looked at. Upper class cut point is the smallest value that could go in the next higher class, okay? A class width is the difference between the cut points of a class Class midpoint is the average of two cut points of a class. When do we use cut point grouping? When the data is continuous and expressed with decimals. So when the data is measured rather than counted, then you wanna do cut point grouping. So you basically, you're not so specific that you say it has to go up to 39, because you might have something like 39.5, 39.99, 39.999, and you, you're like, ah, where do I draw the line? So you just say 30 to less than 40. You, you can't cut it off like at a specific value because your data is continuous, okay? So let's look at an example here. The US National Center for Health Statistics published data on weights and heights by age and sex in the document Vital and Health Statistics. The weight shown in Table 2.8, and we know weight is continuous, right? It's measured. 
Um, and people don't just come in like increments of whole pounds. You, you can be like, oh, you either weigh 150 or 151. Nobody weighs anything in between, right? No, that doesn't, that's not how weight works. So we know it's continuous. Um, the weights are given to the nearest tenth of a pound. And this was obtained from a sample of 18 to 24 year old males. Use cut point grouping to organize these data into frequency and relative frequency distributions, and then use a class width of 20 and a first cut point of 120. Okay, so they're kind of like holding our hand, and, and I'm not mad about it, you know? Like, tell me where to start and tell me what to do. It'll go nicely. So we're going to record their weights, which is in pounds, and then record the frequency and the relative frequency. And they told me uh -huh, to start with 120 and use class widths of 20. So that means 120 up until something and then my next class would start at 140 since the class width is 20. Then the next one would be 160, 180. Now, how high do we have to go? What was the biggest observation? I Ooh, look at this, 278.8, okay. So 200, 220, 240. And then 260 would go up until under 280, right? Because the next one would be 280 and no one fell in there. So that's enough classes. That's how I figured that out. Okay, so for the, to figure out the upper class cut point, see, like I was saying earlier, you can't say, for example, this needs to be 139, because what if someone weighs like 139.9? So what we do instead is we say up until under 140, you know? Another way you could write that, if you're like fancy with your little math notation, you could say less than 140. Same thing, okay? I'll use words because that's what the book does, but same idea, under 140. Then you go 140 to under 160. And then under 180. Under 200. Under 220 under 240 and under 260 okay good now it's up to us to see how many observations fall into each class okay so i already did it for you you can pause the video and check me if you want three nine fourteen seven three zero zero and the total made me nervous, but then I checked and they told me what the total was. So I was like, why was I nervous? 37, there's 37 observations in this data set. So then to get the relative frequency, you divide each of these observations by 37. Okay, and I rounded to three decimal places. Why? I just decided, sorry guys, okay. So just pay attention if they tell you specifically how, how much to round. Um, so 9 divided by 37 is going to be 0.243. And then keep going. Um, 14 divided by 37, 0 0.378. 0 0.189. 0 0.081. These are just zeros. And then 0 0.027. Now this time the sum of my relative frequencies was 0.999 because I did have to round on some of those. So it didn't sum up to exactly one, but it's, just, it's good enough, okay? Good, so just to recap, we went over three different grouping methods for data. The first one was single value grouping, and you wanna use this when you have discrete data, so data that you count and there's only a small number of distinct values. Okay, you don't have a lot of different observations. Like the number of TVs, right? Nobody had 45 TVs, so like it was zero to six. That's a pretty small range. If the range is small, use single value grouping. Limit grouping, you wanna use that when the data is expressed as whole numbers, okay? 
So it's still counted, not measured, it's discrete usually. And there's too many distinct values to employ single value grouping. There would just be too many classes. And then the last one is cut point grouping, and you want to use this when the data is continuous and it's expressed with decimals. Okay? So now that we can make um, frequency and relative frequency tables with our quantitative data, we're going to use those to make graphs. And the first kind of graph we're going to talk about is a histogram. And it displays the classes of the quantitative data on the horizontal axis and then the frequencies on the vertical axis. And we did this already with our qualitative data, right? And then the frequency, or you could do relative frequency or percent for each class is represented by a vertical bar whose height is equal to the frequency or relative frequency or percent. And the bars should be positioned so that they touch. These bars touch each other. Okay. Oh. And then for single value grouping, we use the distinct values of the observations to label the bars with each such valued centered under the bar. For limit or cut point grouping, then you use your lower class limits or lower class cut points to label the bars. Sometimes you'll see people putting class midpoints or whatever under the bar. I mean, you, you have some variety here. The good news is you won't really be making too many of these by hand. I will do them by hand for you, but when you're working on your homework exercises, you're just gonna select the appropriate graph organize the data first and then you know in practice if you ever want to make a graph you can just use excel stat crunch whatever i don't know if you've ever played around with chart wizard i was probably the only weird kid who would like randomly put data in excel and then play around with chart wizard <laughs> i thought it was so fun okay i can show you one after this so create a frequency histogram and relative frequency histogram for the previous example so we, d we looked at this data, this was all the weights, right, of those males, 18 to 24. So they're asking us to make a frequency histogram and a relative frequency histogram. So I'm going to make the frequency histogram first. Notice the largest observation was 14. So that's how high I need to make the y-axis here. Um, and then x-axis... I'm going to list all the class limits, okay? Now, here's something. The smallest one starts at 120. So, like, I'm going to call this zero, but I'm not going to really, like, count all the way out to here to, like, and say this is 120, blah, blah, blah. That's so crazy. We would have, like, this huge gap in our graph, right? So when you just want to start close to zero, but you're not scaling, um, in reference to the origin correctly, you just put this little double slash and you go, hey, everybody, I'm, I know I'm not spacing this perfectly, but I don't want to start like way far out to the right. So I'm putting 120 here and then we're going to go to, you know, like 140, like this, 160, 180, 200. You see what's going on? Okay, cool. 220, 240, 260 and then 280. And then the frequencies are gonna have to go up to 14. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Okay, so this is the frequency. And then this is the weight in pounds. Okay. So from 120 to 140, the frequency was three. So I put a height of three right there. Oh no, am I gonna be obsessive with this? I think so. It's one of those days, guys. Okay, we're just gonna let it go. 140 to 160, the height is 9, so like right there. You know what? I'm just going to draw by hand because I'm, see, that was just me. That was not me using the autocorrect to straighten. That's not bad, huh? 14. I have to tell you guys a funny story. When I was younger, my grandpa would give me a blank piece of paper and just have me draw the longest straight line I could. 
not a weird thing to do when you're hanging out with your grandkid. Um, he thought it was an important life skill I needed to work on. And here I am. Thank you, Bobby. I'm drawing such straight lines now. Okay, seven. Then back to three. You guys, these should be even. This one's embarrassing me. Yes. Okay, better. Seven, and then zero, zero, so nothing there. And then one. Okay, so here's our histogram. Not bad for by hand, okay. I'm just doing this so it looks nice. You don't have to color them in. And that's it. Now, relative frequency, I'm sure you can imagine, look at what a pain it's gonna be. So I'm gonna show you guys right now how to do a nice little graph in Excel, okay? Okay, so you can see here I have all of the weights and their relative frequencies. I'm just in Google Sheets instead of Excel, so I can screen record. So you highlight all your data, and then over here, insert chart. If you don't see that icon, you can just go insert chart, and then it will usually automatically come up with, you know, what would fit the data the best. And here it has relative frequency versus weight, bam. Um, the only thing is the bars should be touching. So you can kind of play around with the customize option here, your chart style. Um, in Excel, it's a lot easier to just change up the style to get the bars to touch. In Google Sheets, it's a little trickier, but I can't screen record in Excel. So sorry about that. And then, you know, you can change up the colors on a lot of stuff. Um, you can change up the title if you wanted to say something else, relative frequency versus weight, and all sorts of stuff, text, um, color, and you can play around with it. You can add a legend if you want, title your axes however you need, but they got it right. The only thing is, like, for the bars need to be touching. So in Excel, you can change that up more easily here. I haven't figured out how to do it yet, but you can see, like, most of the time, you're not going to be making a graph by hand. You're just going to have all the data values. You can even do this in StatCrunch or all sorts of other places, and it comes out really nice. And then, you know, you can play around with it. <laughs> There's so many different um, chart styles. So obviously the most appropriate one for this is a, you know, a column chart. You can make a pie chart really easily. You can do all sorts of other things depending on what's appropriate for your data. So when I tell you I used to play around with this as a kid, I kid you not. I kid you not. All right, so the next type of graph that we're going to discuss is a dot plot. And a dot plot is a graph in which each observation is plotted as a dot at an appropriate place above a horizontal axis. And observations having equal values are stacked vertically. And this is useful for showing the relative positions of the data in a data set or for comparing two or more data sets. So here we're being asked to construct a dot plot for the given data. Again, I want to figure out like what's my min, what's my max. So it looks like this is giving us data on prices in dollars of 16 DVD players. Does anyone buy DVD players anymore? Hmm. Um, okay, so $197 looks like it's the min, and 224 is the max. So what you do is you just make a horizontal axis, and it needs to span from 197 to 224. You could go a little bit further if you want. I already did it. Look at me. Um, so I started mine at 190 all the way up to 230. That way I was safe, okay? And then what you do is you just place a dot above the value that corresponds with each observation. So like here's 210. So I'm just going to put a dot right here at 210. I'm going to go across the top row first. Okay, then there's 219 dot, 214 dot, 197 dot, 224, 219. Oh, I already had a 219. So you just go up. You see how that works? Then 199 another 199, so just go up above it, 208, 209, 215, another 199, ooh, maybe it was on sale, huh, because like 199 sounds so much better than 200, 199 for your DVD player, 212, 
another 212. 219. Ooh, again. And then 210. So this is our dot plot. And you can see it's basically a frequency distribution, right? It's like your histogram. Each of when the dots are stacked like this, right? That's like giving the height if this was a histogram that this has a frequency of three, this has a frequency of three, etc. Okay. All right, same thing too. When you're doing your homework, you're just gonna have to like select the correct dot plot. So just so you know how it works. All right, moving on, we have stem and leaf diagram. So in a stem and leaf diagram, or sometimes they're called stem plots, each observation is separated into two parts, namely a stem, which usually consists of all the digits except the last one on the right, and then the leaf, which is that last digit on the right, okay? These are, I don't know why I always like these so much. I think they look so cute. So construct a stem and leaf diagram for the given data using one line per stem, which makes sense because the data is two digits. So let's first figure out what's the smallest, what's the largest observation, people. 36 looks like it's the smallest, right? And then the largest, oh, 99. Okay, so that means all my stems, I'll do it here so you can see what's going on. The stems are going to go from three to nine. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And then what you do to start, you find all the values that have three in the tens digit and then list whatever the ones digit is afterwards. I'll show you what I mean right now. Don't worry. So 38, that's going here, right? 38. What else? We've got, oh, 39. So then I put a nine. Anything else with a three in the tens digit? Three as the stem? Yeah, 36. So 36. Then you repeat now for fours, okay? So 40 somethings, that's what I'm looking for. 40 somethings, do I have anything? Oh, here's 47, that's it, okay, 47. Okay, now we're looking for 50 somethings, 55, so five. Second row, anything in the second row? Nope. Third row, yeah. 56, 51. So 6, 1. What else? Ooh, 57, 53, 50, 55. So I'm going to put a 7, a 3, a 0, a 5. See? And then I think there's one more. Yeah. 51. Six, keep going. So 64, 64, 65, 64, 64, 65, and then two, seven, zero, nine. Two, seven, zero, nine. What else? Eight. And three, six. Did I get all of them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, so just keep going like that. Like for seven, I have zero, five, one. I already did this. Zero, nine, eight, zero. For eight, you have five, nine, one. Seven zero three six for nine 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 five eight. Okay, then this is like your first draft through. Okay, what you want to do is arrange all of these cute little leaves so that they're in ascending order. Okay, so then you redo it and you go. Here's my final answer. Here's the stems. Here's the leaves. Boop. And then you're going to still go from three to nine, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But then now I'm going to put the leaves in order. So six, eight, nine. And try to evenly space them. Seven. This is going to go zero, one, one, three, five, five, six, seven. Six is going to go zero, two, three. Four, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, 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 one, five, eight, nine. You get the idea, right? Okay. Oops. Why am I erasing them? Okay. So just put them in ascending order. And the thing I want you to observe is if you turn these graphs on their side, again, it's just a histogram because it's showing you the frequency of each of the observations. So say I took this graph and I turned it. Ooh, right? This is giving me like each observation. You could think of each of these as a class. And then the frequency here, notice this is the highest frequency because it had the most leaves on it. So if you just turn them sideways, you could see what has, how the distribution looks basically. Okay, we didn't need to turn it. I'm just showing you. Good, so we're done. That would be your final answer. This cute little guy here. Okay, very good. So, one more example I want to show you. Um, make a stem and leaf diagram for the given data using, first it says one line per stem, and then two lines per stem. So look at what we're talking about. This time it's three digit data. Your leaves are always going to be one digit. So that means the stems are going to be two digits. What do I mean by that? Okay, so the smallest value I see is 197, and the largest... This is cholesterol levels, ooh, for 20 high level patients. 224. So you're gonna go for your stems, 19, 20, 21, 22. So two digits, because the leaves are always just one digit, okay? Um, one line per stem. So you would do like 197, and then there's two 199s, and then there's a 208, and a 209, anyways, etc. So 0, 2, 2, 9, 9, 4, 5, 9, 0. I would need to reorder that, and then 4. So that's one line per stem. You know what, let me reorder this before it's too late. So for 2, I have 210 twice, and then I have 212 twice, 214, 215, and 219 three times. Okay, this is for one line per stem. And then you might say, oh my goodness, there were you know, so many here. I basically only have like four classes, right? One, two, three, four. And normally our rule is like between five and 20. So maybe I should split it up and do two lines per stem. Think of it like two classes per stem. So what does that mean? So you're going to list each of the stem values twice. <sighs> what are we doing? Okay, look. So you've got 19, list it twice. 20, list it twice. 21, and then 22. Okay, then from here, you're only going to put the leaves that are between 0 and 4 in the first one, and then 5 to 9 in the second one. And then same thing, 0 to 4 here five to nine you don't have to write that i'm just telling you so notice like for the leaves for 19 nothing was between zero and four so they're all going to fall in the second stem seven nine nine same thing for 20 nothing in the zero to four stem but eight and nine yeah then here this is where it's going to be helpful so i'm going to break these up into two groups so zero zero Two two four goes in the first stem, and then five nine 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 goes in the second stem, and then that four goes in the first stem of twenty two. You see how it works? So that's useful. Maybe if you have too few classes, see how we only have four here, too few stems, um, and then you want to like split the data up a little bit more so you could see how the distribution falls. And again, you know, turn this sucker on its side. And bam. Oh, okay, I see. I see how the data is falling, right? We're going to talk about distribution shapes later, but something like this. Okay, very good. Excellent work, everybody. Now, the time has come. I told you we're going to talk about distribution shapes later. 
So the distribution of a data set is a table, graph, or formula that provides the values of the observations and how often they occur. So for example, here's a relative frequency histogram and an approximating smooth curve. This is the smooth curve right here for the distribution of heights, okay? And we wanna analyze the shape of our distributions because it gives us a lot of information about the data we collected and characteristics that we're trying to learn from. So three important general aspects of the shape of a distribution involve modality, symmetry, and skewness. So modality has to do with how many peaks there are in a graph. We'll talk about what a mode is later, but unimodal means that there's one peak, okay, in the graph, one max. Bimodal would be that there's two, and multimodal is just more than two. Okay, how many peaks is the modality of the graph? Symmetry. So basically, is the graph symmetric with respect to the y-axis if you were to put it right in the middle, okay, of the data values? So a bell-shaped graph is symmetric. Even this funky triangular graph that is symmetric, if you were to fold it in half, you would have a mirror image on both sides. And this boring uniform distribution is also symmetric because if I folded it right here in the middle, I'd have two even halves, right? It's a mirror image. If a graph is not symmetric, then it's skewed, okay? And these are how we described, this is how we described skewness. If there's this little tail, okay, and trailing of extra values off to the right, it's right skewed. If the values trail off on the left, then it's left skewed. And this funky looking thing is a reverse J-shaped distribution. Because, you know, J looks like this, so this is reverse J-shaped. All right, so what you're going to have to do when you're working on your homework They'll just show you different distributions and you categorize it, okay? Just describe it. So state whether the distribution is roughly symmetric, right skewed, or left skewed. And if you can't tell, draw yourself like a little approximating curve and notice how there's an extra chunk of values. It's trailing off right here. So this data is right skewed. It's not roughly symmetric. And then if we want to talk about the modality, we could. I see only one peak, so it's unimodal. Okay. So remember, we have unimodal, bimodal, or multimodal. They didn't ask for modality, but I feel like being an overachiever and giving it to them. Okay. That's it for 2-4. It's really not going to be too gnarly. Last thing, just be aware that graphs can often be set up in a way that's misleading. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. So just be careful, be an intelligent consumer, citizen, member of society. When you're reading a graph, look at how it's scaled. Look at how things are spaced apart. Look at the decisions that was made, that were made when the graph was put together because oftentimes they can be put together in a way to give you a certain impression that things are more dramatic perhaps than they really are or less dramatic, etc. okay? So be savvy, make sure that you are aware that these things are going on. And one of the um, like techniques that leads to a misleading graph is a truncated graph. So notice here, if you're looking at like unemployment rates, which graph makes it seem like, oh my goodness, unemployment is changing so rapidly over the months. This is September, October, November, December, January, February, March. You're like, oh my goodness, it's just all over the place, right? But observe, this is a truncated graph because the observations are starting at seven. So what that does is it amplifies any little change so much more. So it looks like unemployment's really drastically changing. Where if we actually started at zero, right, and only went up to eight, that's what the percentages are that were given. We can see that it's actually very little variability going on right here. This graph is not truncated, but this one was put together in a way to make it seem like it's more volatile, right? Or perhaps that things are really dipping badly, like, oh my goodness, it's March. Look at unemployment so much better now than it was before. I don't know. March looks pretty much the same as all the other months, really, if you compare it, okay? So that's one thing to be leery of. The other thing is improper scaling. 
So say this is the scenario that the number of homes this year will be doubled, right? That are being new homes that are being built. So the developer, they're making this graph and they're like, oh, look, this was last year. And now we're doubling how many homes we're making. So they took this dimension, they doubled it. And then they took this dimension and they doubled it. But you guys, area is a two dimensional quantity. So if you double both components, now you're actually quadrupling the area. And this is deceptive because it looks like they're actually gonna build four times the real amount of homes. And you'll see this sometimes too, like here's the before and then here's the after. And they all of a sudden made it really huge to make you think that more went on than it really did. So there's just gonna be a, a few examples in the homework. We're just gonna have to identify what sort of technique was going on to make a graph deceptive. And that's really all that we need to talk about it because when we make our graphs, we're not gonna be deceptive, so that's that. So that concludes the video. Hope you enjoyed it. And then we're going to start moving into chapter three next. So stay tuned, guys. Give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'll talk to you guys soon.